So Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for that account that recounts great things done of old, great things done through you and in you, by faith in you. And now as we seek to open up that word and understand it, so we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come, to guide my speaking, and to speak into the lives of each one of us, that we might be drawn to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> After a break of some weeks, we're returning to the book of Hebrews, and we take up this wonderful letter in chapter 11. Here, the writer gives us a list of heroes of faith from the Old Testament. These are all people who trusted in God, those who believed God and took him at his word. Faith is a lively confidence in God and in his promises. Real faith not only takes God at his word, but moves the one believing to step out to take risks because they trust in God. Genuine faith transforms the believer, motivating them to act, to place themselves into God's hands and to obey him. All the persons named in Hebrews 11 possessed this faith and each one was used by God to transform the world in which they lived. Well, this week we come to verse 27. The writer devotes a major section of this chapter to the example of Moses. And last time, if you can remember back that far, we saw how Moses chose to forsake the luxury and the privilege of being Pharaoh's daughter's adopted son to embrace the suffering of the Hebrew people. Because Moses believed God he chose to look forward to the reward that God had promised his people. Choosing to be mistreated in the short term, looking forward to God's promise of deliverance. And in verse 27, the writer tells us that by faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. <coughs> Exodus 2 tells us how Moses left Egypt. God had moved him to seek out his own people. He saw the suffering of the Jewish people, his own people, and it's clear that God had already put it into his heart to work for the deliverance of the people of God. And seeing an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, Moses killed the Egyptian, burying him in the sand, thinking that no one saw. Moses thought that he was delivering one of his own people, and in doing so, committed murder. He saw, he saw the problem, but he chose to do things his way. God had something much bigger in mind. Not just the saving of one man from a beating. Rather, God wanted to use Moses 
to save all 12 tribes of Israel. Thousands upon thousands of people, rescuing them from slavery, leading them to a land of their own. The problem was that Moses was trying to do things his way, operating in his own strength. Before God could use Moses, he had to bring him to a place of humble obedience and faith. Moses had an important lesson to learn. In fact, it's a lesson that we need to learn as well. That God does not want people to do things for him. He wants us to do things in him, with him, and through him. When we do things our own way, in our own wisdom, using our own strength, we will fall into sin. Moses wanted to deliver his own people from their suffering, and his way resulted in murder. Doing things our own way is at the heart of sin. This is what our first ancestors did in Genesis 3. They chose to go their own way. They chose to disobey God, and in doing so, their actions destroyed the human race. Doing things our own way has resulted in all the misery and pain that humanity has suffered through the ages. When we choose to do it our way, even if we think we're doing it for God, we actually exclude him. We assert our independence. And that's even if our intentions are good, like Moses. Our actions are sinful. As it's written in Proverbs 14, there is a way that appears right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. All sin ends in death. The wages of sin is death. When we sin, when we choose to go our own way, we die spiritually. We cut ourselves off from God. And this is why Jesus had to come to earth. This is why God was made flesh in Jesus. He came to earth to mop up our mistakes, to wipe away our sin with his own blood. Jesus, God himself, died for our sin. He tasted death for us, that we, might be forgiven and have life. We've cut ourselves off from God. We've earned death and hell. But through Jesus, God has made a way for us to find forgiveness and life eternal. Jesus sacrificed for our sins once for all when he offered himself in our place on the cross. And he invites all, all of us, to come to him, to change direction, to repent, to cease to go our own way and walk with him. He offers us life and forgiveness, a new way, going God's way. And he will guide us with his spirit, who he's poured out on us, generously and lavishly. Moses had to learn this lesson. He had to learn to go God's way. And when it became known that he'd murdered the Egyptian who was beating that Hebrew, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, tried to have him killed. So Moses had to leave Egypt. Now the writer of Hebrews tells us that he didn't fear the king's anger, verse 27. But Moses left Egypt a failure, a murderer, and he went into the wilderness of Midian, beyond the Red Sea, into the desert. God loved him and desired to use him. But Moses had to wait until he was 80 years old 
before he was sufficiently humble and willing to do things God's way. Even in the desert, God loved him, providing a wife and a family for him. And there, in the deserts of Midian, Moses became a shepherd. He who would deliver the Hebrews, he who was brought up as a prince, lived as a nomad in the deserts of Midian and Sinai. He had to be humble and come to the point where he, would, where, where he would obey God and go his way. Self-will and self-determination are abhorrent to God. Now the world values these sins and would call them virtues, but they aren't. Self-will and self-determination are strong, sinful traits within the hearts of all men and women. God wants people who will surrender their wills and offer him their futures. After all, he is God. He's our creator. He sees all. He knows the future. He sees things that we do not. And being God, his way is always perfect. Our sight is always partial. So the wisest thing we can do is to put ourselves, our way, and our future into God's almighty hands. He wants us to trust ourselves entirely to him. And he promises that he'll guide us into the way that is right for us. The way that is best for us, for him and for everyone else. For Moses, it was only at the age of 80, after at least 40 years living in the desert, working as a shepherd, that Moses was ready to be called. And in our first reading from Exodus 3, we have that lovely exchange that took place on Mount Horeb between God and Moses. And if you read it, God is almost playful with Moses. He's watched over Moses all the time he was in Midian. And now at the age of 80, when people usually retire and lay down their ministries, that God chose, him, ch chose to call him into service. At an age when most would have written Moses off, God called him to action. In Exodus 3, we're told that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. Bushes often catch fire, but the fire consumes them. It turns the bush into ash. But here, there was a bush on fire. The fire burned, but the bush was not consumed. Here was fire that was burning without fuel. Fire that burned and didn't harm the bush. God was getting Moses' attention. The angel of the Lord appeared to him. Now, wherever it says the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, this is always more than an angelic visitation. As here, when the angel of the Lord appears, God himself speaks. Now, that, there are those who say that where it says the angel of the Lord, that this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. But it doesn't say that anywhere, so I don't think that we can say it. It's clear that God is speaking. But this, like many things, remains a mystery that we will not truly understand on earth. But God is clearly closely involved. But remember that God may not be seen. Just as he said to Moses in Exodus 33, 
you cannot see my face and live. So whether an angel gets Moses' attention and God speaks from heaven, we don't know. We're not told. It's always on a need-to-know basis. On an earth, we don't need to know. But what we do know is that in Exodus 3, Moses encounters God and hears him speak directly to him. So God calls Moses from within the bush. Moses! Moses! And when Moses approached the bush, God said, Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Moses had to learn exactly who he was dealing with. God is holy, above us and beyond us. We cannot treat him lightly, for he is holy. And Moses fell on his face. He was filled with a holy fear. And this is always the right way to approach God. Not with a sense of terror, but with a deep sense of reverence and awe. He's God. He's not a human being. He's God, the creator, all-powerful and all-holy. God loves us but we should always approach him with a sense of awe. Moses had to learn this lesson, and so do we. God is not our mate to be manipulated by us. He's God to be obeyed. We don't debate with him, we humbly obey. And here, on Mount Horeb, God reveals himself to Moses, calling him into service. Moses gets to hear God speak, and there on that mountain, God reveals to Moses his holy name. I am who I am. I am the God who exists. God who is without beginning or ending. God who has always existed and will always be. God who is sufficient in himself, who needs nothing. That fire burned without, without fuel. God needs nothing. He's, he's the source of life and the creator of all things. Giving life to all. He is to be worshipped, honoured, and obeyed. This moment at the age of 80 is the pivotal point in Moses' life. God was calling Moses into humble, obedient service. This experience on Mount Horeb was the defining point in Moses' life. God was calling Moses into service at the age of 80. He was calling him to absolute obedience. He was calling Moses into an immense task to bring God's people out of slavery in Egypt. This wasn't just the saving of one man. It was the saving of an entire nation. God's plans are always bigger than our minds can conceive. This would be an onerous task. One begun at the age of 80, a calling that would last for 40 years. And in Hebrews 11, the writer continues that Moses persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Moses was able to persevere to fulfill his calling with humble obedience and faithful trust because of this encounter with God. This encounter with the invisible God enabled him to go back to Egypt 
and to defy the most powerful man in the world, the all too visible Pharaoh. Now we may not be called to lead thousands of people out of slavery, but God does call each of us, whoever we are, into humble, faithful trust and obedience. God calls each of us to service and obedience. And if we are to persevere, if we are to be faithful to the end, then we need to have our own vision of God. We will not get to see God with our eyes. He is the invisible God. But we do need to have a right understanding of who our God is. He's greater than our minds can conceive. He's God. He's transcendent. He's beyond us. He's all-powerful. He's triune. God in three persons. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. One, yet three. Three, yet one. Beyond our understanding. He's holy, he's perfect, he is all love, he's all grace, he's all mercy. And he requires our absolute trust and obedience. We must not treat him lightly, but we can tell him anything. He wants to be intimately involved in your life and in mine. So like Moses, we need to have a right view, a proper vision of God who loves us and calls us, of God who gave Jesus to die for us. We need to maintain that vision in worship, in prayer, in sitting in silence, contemplating his presence. We need to maintain that vision and then we will act rightly. We need to learn to listen. God is greater than we can imagine. But he doesn't speak with a great booming voice as he did on Mount Sinai. He speaks with a still, small voice. We need to learn to hear it to recognize him. As with Moses, God requires our obedience. And as with Moses, he calls us into service. And that's whether we're 18 or 83 or 103. God has work for you to do. At 83, our service will be different to what it was at 18. But nevertheless, he calls us. And while ever we have breath, there is work, witness, and or prayer for us to do. God calls you and me to humble obedience. This was a lesson that Moses had to learn. And he spent 40 years in the wilderness before he learned it. So the question is, are you listening? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example of Moses, that man who was supremely human, who was so greatly used of you. Father, we thank you for his example. And we ask, Lord, that you would grant to us a clear vision of who you are. That we might approach you rightly with a sense of awe and wonder, ready to hear and be obedient to your call. So, Father, we ask in the name of Jesus, that you would grant us 
ears to hear, sight to see, and grace that we might bow our wills to yours and obey the call that you place on our lives, whatever call that might be. And grant that we might retain that vision, for then we will be faithful to the end. Grant that to us, we pray, through Jesus' name.